All right, welcome to this uh, session for Linux Fest 2024. Uh, today we have Worth a Thousand Words, Youth Telling Their Story with Pictures and Their Own App by Joe Stanley. Thank you, take it away. Great, thanks Ryan. Uh, as introduced, my name is Joe Stanley. I am a lead automation engineer for um, a company based out of Pullman, Washington. But um, this weekend, it's it's a great privilege of mine to be able to present remotely. And I thank the organizers um, of Linux Fest Northwest to allow me to do that um, because I'm actually helping with a 4-H teen retreat this weekend. Uh, and we're organizing some summer camps that are all focused on STEM and getting youth inspired and excited about science, technology, engineering, and math. Uh, early um, so that they might be able to continue to foster those interests and grow as they as they become a little older. But, uh, you know, so this weekend or this this uh, um, during this presentation, I'll be speaking from my volunteer and leader perspective, as well as a mentor and um, with a little bit of my electrical engineering background. So I, I would be remiss if I didn't start off at least by mentioning a little bit about what 4-H is before we get into some of the technical uh, details um, that I'm hoping to share with you today. So 4-H at its core is positive youth development. It's organized by the land grant institutions or the land grant universities in each of the 50 states. Um, so it's organized through those universities extension systems, right? Really trying to provide education to the core of the community in every state um, that the land grant institutions serve, right? Trying to help facilitate the growth of community members in the communities where they live. Um, and 4-H is just sort of the, the youth extension of that piece, right? Really trying to empower youth to become uh, great leaders, great speakers, folks that are comfortable in, in all sorts of settings, doing all sorts of things. And that ranges from growing livestock and crops to fixing computer systems and building a, a safer, more secure web experience for everyone, right? A little bit of all of those things kind of comes into 4-H. So, um, I'll mention really quickly, just from the perspective of the state of Idaho, we serve more than 70,000 youth annually uh, in the 4-H programs. A great number of those youth are impacted by STEM outreach programs, right? Tinkering with rockets, computer skills, hacking skills are also something that's on the rise, right? And, and hacking in, in you know, both senses, right? Positive impact there. Again, really trying to instill some of those best practices, those good behaviors, and give youth an experience and a chance to really um, you know, adapt those skills. So I'll talk a little bit um, just about where 4-H is and where we're going. 4-H um, is really focused in, in trying to find an interest the young person may have and really kind of enhancing that interest and developing that into a passion, connecting them with community, right? The 4-H pledge says for my community or my, my club, my community, my country, and my world, really trying to give a sense and instill that sense of um, community impact and service um, in so many ways. You can see here on this graph, right, we're, we're impacting youth in many other ways than, you know, what might be considered traditional programming in the worlds of animal vet science or maybe growing crops, right? We have everything from clothing, textile, and designs, creative arts, uh, health and wellness, natural science, self-determined projects where the youth create their own curriculum, and of course, tech, engineering, and computer science. So in that area alone, we've got a number of different project opportunities. You can see here, we've got a number of electricity projects. In fact, I was just burning resistors and blowing up capacitors just this week with youth to try and get them excited about, oh, if I learn these algebra skills, I can apply that and make it make sense and do something cool with that. Um, but also working on some of the computer science pieces. So as I begin to transition now, I'll mention one of our premier state events, which is offered for teens. The, the State Teen Association has a convention each year held on the University of Idaho campus in Moscow, Idaho. Now that university campus is the seat of 4-H in the state. And of course, University of Idaho being the land grant institution, that's where most of this programming is offered from. Now, this conference is really focused on what happens after high school, right? Is that trade school? Is that certificates? Is that getting directly into the workforce? Or is that going to college or university to, you know, um, further advance your skills in some specific field? 
Um, this conference is built to engage youth. And a big part of that, and I think something that we can all recognize, especially after COVID, is the social impacts, right? The ramifications of connecting peers and actually building those interpersonal skills and the ability to talk with others and communicate and share ideas and, and, and have a good time at the same time, right? A big part of this conference is really focused on that social engagement aspect. Great number of youth in Idaho are from very rural communities, places that maybe their school isn't very large. I graduated with a, a graduating class size of eight in my community. That's that's eight students, and one of them didn't make it. Um, so it's a, it's a really big part having this conference and allowing youth from all over the state to come together in one place and meet and mingle and work with each other. And one of the ways that we engage with them, of course, is something like a photo contest. Right. And, and that piece really is to sort of help foster growth in many different ways. Right. We have this technology. Let's use it. Right. Kids are already taking pictures of one another, having selfie contests, doing that thing. Let's formalize that. Let's help them build a you know, positive impact, a positive way of, of doing that and interacting with each other. Right. Let's do a little bit of team building with this. Right. And this is a great opportunity to sort of build some teams get some collaboration, start to work on those ways to express ideas, share thoughts, right? And maybe build a little bit of healthy competition at the same time. The state of Idaho is broken up into four different and unique districts, the Northern, Southern, Eastern, and Central districts. But those really are, are built to support that connection and building a little bit of camaraderie between the teens, um, helping them to build up a little bit of team spirit and, and again, kind of hearkening back to that, having some healthy competition, right? It can be very, very valuable for those youth to get some chance, get some, get some excitement built around some of these programs. Um, and the photo contest can help facilitate that. The next piece, of course, is then recording some of those memories, right? Sharing these things. I, as, a, as a youth myself, I actually attended this conference for a couple of years. Um, and I can't count the number of times I've gone back to some of the same pictures and look back fondly on some of the memory, memories that I built. And of course, we would be you know, remiss if we didn't mention the fact that we do use it for future advertising, right? We want these programs to grow, to impact more Idaho students and have a really positive impact across the state. And you know, one of the greatest ways of doing that is sharing the experiences that youth had, all of the positive and wonderful times that they had, and perhaps even learning from some of the negative times, right? We wanna understand how to make the best better, which of course is the 4-H motto, um, and one of the best ways to do that is really to understand where we're coming from and what things we might need to build on. But with this photo contest comes the question of, well, how do we manage it, right? There's some pieces that can get a little bit fuzzy here, right? And, and how do we organize things? How do we put everything together? The first question that always comes to my mind is, where are we going to put all this stuff, right? We've got hundreds of teens taking these pictures, but where are they going to put them? For a number of years, we tried different alternatives. Are we going to use something like Facebook or Instagram and perhaps use a hashtag where the photos can be made public and organized in, in that aspect? Are we going to use something like Google Drive where we basically have you know a, a few different links where each of the districts can place their photos or upload their photos to those particular services? Are we going to use something else? Maybe maybe a OneDrive, that way the university can manage it, or maybe something else entirely. You know, another piece that comes to mind is, is managing that content, right? Some of the concerns that comes to mind, for me at least, is, well, if we're going to have this contest, and we have four districts, each of which are competing against the three others, uh, we have to be able to separate them and organize, say, Northern District from Southern. So in the case of a Facebook or an Instagram, right, we have to have four different hashtags that we have to secure every year, right? And that becomes sort of a burden. And it also means that it's a little bit more difficult to accumulate all of those at the end of the conference, right? That's not something that can just easily be pulled to access things for that future advertising piece or sharing the experience with other youth, let alone things in the, the heat of the moment in the conference itself when we're trying to prepare an end of conference slideshow that we can share with all of the youth, all of the experiences that everybody had during the week. The next piece, you know, that kind of goes directly into that organizational piece, right? Tying some of these things together 
where does Northern District go? Where does Southern District go? And what happens if I post a Southern District photo to a Northern District hashtag, right? Some of that becomes a little bit more challenging. With a, a tool like Facebook, you know, that's not easily managed, right? I can't, as a moderator, go in and move that photo to the appropriate place after a team comes to me and says, hey, I did this thing. I meant to put it here, right? That's not an easy story to tell. Um, additionally, you know, using a tool like Google Drive, some of those things become a little bit easier to manage, but it, it still can be sort of tedious, right? If I don't have the, you know, the rights to that Google Drive, I can't do anything for you. And some of those pieces can be a little bit more challenging to manage. The last thing that I think is also very important to focus on with photos of youth is obtaining consent, right? In a great majority of these, we, well, certainly for all of the youth attending the conference, as they apply for the conference, their parent or guardian needs to actually sign a document that says yay or nay in terms of their consent to photos being used for future use, right? But that doesn't necessitate, or necessitate that um, photos taken and uploaded to a place like Facebook, Google Drive, or other places will have those same restrictions adhered to by those systems. Um, and we, as the moderators and planners of these events, can't manage that either. So that becomes sort of challenging also. So that's where this sort of solution comes in. And that's where I sort of got involved here. Let's see, a few years back, taking us back to, I guess, what would have been um, 2021, as we're still sort of dealing with the ramifications of COVID and masking restrictions and other things for the teen conference, we, um, we, decide, we started to decide to bring some of these programs back in person, and we were starting to evaluate what that, be, what that was going to look like. As part of that, I got involved and said, you know, hey, I think we've, you know, we've got a challenge here. This is always a pain to administer, but maybe we can do something about that. At the time, I had just become familiar with some of the tools available, um, such as some of the self-hosted, um, you know, uh, photo services, Lychee, Photoprism, now Image, and others, right? There are a number of these services, all which have different features and functionalities. Um, and so I started to do a little bit of evaluation on those services. And I thought, well, this could be a really great optimal solution, right? We control the access rights. We control the destinations of photos we can really make something here. So what we ended up doing is we started down this path of creating a custom upload interface uh, with this Lychee backend to basically permit youth to engage with a system in a way that was simple, specifically tailored to their needs and allowed them to get right to the meat of it, right? And, and get back to the conference activities, get back to their friends, their peers, and that social aspect, which is so important for this conference. Um, so what we ended up doing is, is building this little pres this little um, upload interface, uh, and you can see that here in the lower left-hand side of the screen of this presentation. You can see the consent dialog, which can be managed, and of course, the upload interface itself. Now, with that upload interface, you've got the ability to actually interact with and decide, do I just want to upload a picture that maybe can be included in the slideshow at the end of the year, or maybe I want to put it as part of my district competition, right? We're starting to collaborate on those pieces. So, um, and of course, I have you know shamelessly snagged a picture of Lychee's uh, great interface here. This is directly from the Lychee.org website, but this is a um, an image that uh, basically represents exactly the the custom functionality that we need. We needed a very simple, easy to navigate, and easy to manage system that we could tie an API into and basically build our custom front ends with no other needs, right? Really made that piece very functional. So what we ended up doing is building a Python web app, but I wanna take a mention here, you know, this is something that could have been done really relatively easy and probably within the span of maybe a few weeks by a full-time developer, but I thought it was going to be a whole lot more fun to do it with youth. So that's sort of the approach we took. And that's part of why we decided to go with something like Python for its approachability, its ease of use, uh, versatile tool set, and great support for testing, uh, which really allowed us to get into a bunch of things. And I'll discuss some of those key feature points in a moment. But what was really exciting is this gave us an opportunity to uh, interact with youth and actually have youth participate in the development of this application. 
So um, about the same time that I started to do this research um, and exploring, you know, and this research really was me, I spun up a Linode um, and, you know, stood, stood up a Docker container of Lychee. I stood up a Docker container of PhotoPrism. At the time, I, I didn't know about image, um, but I, I've since looked into it, right? And I was basically just evaluating features and, and looking across them um, to see what was really needed or what we needed out of those sets and, and what was going to work for us. So what I ended up going with here was a pretty simple system, right? You can kind of see here in this model, basically how things are broken out. We obviously are using Nginx as our reverse proxy is kind of shown here in this diagram. And the way a user would interact with this is they would typically come into the interface and they would go to the website and they'd be presented with a simple, easy to navigate um, upload interface. And from there, they can select what district they want to upload their photos for. They collect, select the photos they want to upload and they click submit and that's it. It's just that simple, right? That's all that we needed in this system. We wanted youth to be able to get the job done and move on, right? I don't want to have to spend a whole lot of time in teaching a young person that, you know, you've got to create an account here. You need to do these other things. Change your name, your email, your phone, your phone number and your physical address and your parents made name, I, you know, I, I don't want to go through that collection process with a young person, uh, nor do I want to have another database where all of, uh, you know, all of these young people's information is stored, right, is another potential vector for their uh, private information being obtained um, improperly. So what we did here, uh, you, we have a, a very simple React-based uh, interface using material, material UI design components. That ties into our Python backend, which also serves the React front end. And our Python backend then connects into the Lychee side using the great API that is super well documented uh, in Lychee. And we're able to tie directly into that and dump all of the photos in. From there, then we're also able to allow fo folks to interact with and view that full database and all of the photos there. Uh, directly through the Lychee interface. Again, a very simple interface that just about anybody can come into and begin to navigate. And we've built it out so that it has a very simple tree architecture um, based on year, state, county, or district level. And then you can drill down even further into the specific event that you're interested in. So I want to talk a lot about, uh, or I want to spend the remainder of the time talking about the development process with youth, because I think that's kind of the exciting part of this. So like I began the presentation with, 4-H is positive youth development. We're trying to find an interest that a young person has and help them foster that into a true passion, something that they're really significantly invested in and they want to see their future go into as well. Now, whether that's you know the traditional sows, cows, and plows or something newer like technology, right? Developing computer uh, skills, developing computer or digital literacy, um, maybe developing programs as we're, as I'm going to talk about today, or many other things also, right? 4-H is that development for a young person. So a part of this, when I got started with this, I reached out to a young person who had mentioned that he'd just taken a little bit of a programming course and he thought it was kind of interesting. You know, again, that interest piece. And I said, well, hey, I've got this really kind of wild idea. Do you want to, you want to get involved? Do you think you might want to, you know, participate? I know what we need to do and I know the steps that we need to take to get there, but I'd like you along for the ride. Is that something you would be interested in? And in this case, Russ <laughs> decided to go along with that. Um, so we had actually met at a teen event that he was helping to organize. It was a very young teen at the time working on organizing this event, but he was very passionate about it. Um, and so I thought, well, great, you've already got some passion about these teen programs. You can kind of understand some of the technical aspects and I can provide some of the coaching. So what we started down was I had at the time uh, and still do to this day, a GitLab server that I run on some hardware in my, in my basement of all places, right? As I think many of us that are hardware geeks probably have, you know, a closet or a basement or something like that. Well, mine's a basement. It's an unfinished basement, but that's a story for a different day. Russ and I started using this GitLab service for a number of reasons. The first of which is I could create his account. I could walk him through all of the tools. If he ever got himself locked out or did something that he felt uncomfortable about, 
I could go in and make those them. I had full control so that I could manage those pieces and manage his privacy to some extent uh, and making it really successful for him to get into the process and understand the workflow that a professional software developer might take while at the same time being safe, secure, and having somebody to sort of be there for him all the way. Another part of the 4-H model is the thought of a, a caring mentor, somebody who is there to help and work with a youth to make sure that they have the tools that they need to succeed, right? We don't need to be holding their hand or pulling them along for all of it, right? We don't need to be their guiding force, but we can be there to supplement them, to hold them up so that they can reach up to the next rung of the ladder and step forward. So that's that's what I'm doing here. And that's kind of what how we were able to start using GitLab. And of course, this is just sort of a snapshot uh, that I took a few days ago of some of our work. And I, I want to point something out here. What's great about some of these tools is that we're able to have some fun with it. If you see one of those tags is marked Greece. Now, some of you may already have some familiarity with the fact that there is a, um, a Greek letter, which is actually a question mark that looks remarkably similar to a semicolon. And of course, it is not a semicolon. So when you introduce it into any sort of code, it doesn't compile like a semicolon. Russ figured that out a couple months into our project, and, and he's been teasing that he was going to drop this in. A, a couple weeks ago, I happened to notice Greece, a branch popped out of nowhere. Now, I've taken a look, and certainly it does have a Greek question mark. But what the fun part is, Russ understands the workflow now. He built that branch on his own. He does that process on his own. When I tell Russ, we're going to start on a new feature. We're going to add something to the project. He says, great. What do we want to call the branch? He understands that's the first step, right? He might not understand the full scope of the picture in Python, right? He might not understand all of the intricacies of the syntax yet, but he gets how to be a developer. He gets how to start that process. He creates the branch. He opens the code editor. He starts to work on it. He understands where we need to go, what the front end is, what the back end is, and why we use the two things independently and how they stitch together. He's able to talk about those pieces, which for me as a mentor is extremely exciting. Those are things that I didn't come into college knowing. He's got them in high school. The kid's 16 years old at this point. Um, and it's just phenomenal to see his growth there. So another piece of the puzzle for us is using another tool, Jenkins in this case, as our CI CD system, right? We're building a website. And for those of you who may have tinkered around with that or built your own websites, your own web applications, right? There's a number of steps to get there from start to finish, right? And that's not something that I wanted Rust to be consumed by. I want him to understand those principles but those aren't things that a professional software developer typically has to understand in a day in, day out sort of process, right? We typically have systems in place that allow us to write code, do our development, close feature requests, and move forward. And that's sort of how we're using Jenkins here. And I've just taken a couple screenshots just to show we've got one that is working and one that isn't. If you're paying attention, Greece in this case is the one that isn't. Surprise, surprise, probably not. But um, the, the point here is that this system takes care of itself, right? This allows me and Russ to focus on the code and we can work on those developer focused skills and let the system sort of take care of itself. Another part of that, right? I mentioned that Russ already understands why we create a branch when I want to start a new feature, when I want to fix a bug, when I want to do other work in the project, I start by creating a branch. And that's where I do my work from. And then I will work on a merge request in GitLab and bring that or introduce that change back into the mainline uh, development workflow. So part of that, to, and to make this simpler, again, with Jenkins, Nginx, and Linux, I was able to make this really, really smooth. You can see here a couple scripts that I use to basically automate the process of creating new websites for every branch created in the GitLab source control. 
Now, the wonderful thing here is, right, I'm managing the entire system, which again means that I don't have to worry about, you know, necessarily nefarious intent here, right? We can build these and I can manage them. I manage the Linux server where these are deployed. I manage the GitLab server where the code is sourced from. I manage the Jenkins server, which does all of the deployments. So I have control over the aspects that may be concerning as far as security, um, but allow me to do the things that make it easier for the young person to get interested in the code and not get caught up in the weeds at the same time. So these tools, these scripts actually go through a process of basically identifying a new port, a new web port uh, or TCP port, I should say, um, that the server can be opened up on and then creating a new Nginx configuration file where everything sort of gets tied up and created. Um, and that really automates the process so that myself and Russ don't have to worry about it, right? We create the new branch and Jenkins spins it up for us. If there's a failure, we, we're notified about it. We can go take a look at the logs and understand, oh, well, it looks like we've got a Greek question mark instead of a semicolon here. <laughs> and maybe we should go fix that, right? Um, another piece of this, right, is we're using, you know, we're using a containerized system for this. Um, and ultimately, the, the advantage of this for us is now I can spin this up anywhere. I could equivalently tell Russ, hey, go ahead, pull these components down on you, onto your local computer and you can spin it up and do local development if you'd like. But in our case, that's really beneficial, again, to be able to um, build these individual branches in reproducible steps and test all along the way, which is really cool too, right? How often is it that we've worked with a, a colleague, a, a coworker, or somebody else in the open source community who, you know, maybe has wonderful intent and is really working on something, but maybe they just didn't run the tests, right? They didn't check to make sure that what they introduced didn't break something else accidentally, right? That comes up all the time. And it's not out of malice. It's not out of bad intent, but maybe it's negligence. Maybe it's forgetfulness. And honestly, it's, it's human. Right. And that's something that I think we need to understand. And that's part of why this system exists. The system can do that work. Right. That's what computers are great at. They love to crunch those numbers and just do those little things for us. And that allows Russ to focus on the skills that he's learning and maybe not worry about, you know, did I remember to run the tests? Well, again, the computer can do that for you. So with that, I'll sort of close here um, and, and just sort of wrap things up. I'll mention here the, the golden uh, link here is a link to the GitLab. And of course, I'm, you know, I'm happy to provide those to anyone who's interested. Um, but these are just sort of a summary of some of the blog posts I've written along the way, because a number of the things that I'm really excited about are, you know, helping Russ understand how to do a little bit of visual development, right? We use Microsoft Word of all things to create some of the 404 and 401 pages that the web application has, right? And Russ had a great time with that, right? He was able to get some of his, some of his creative side out and really dive into something silly and fun uh, and be able to share that and, and make it um, really fun for the web application. Along with that, right, I, I've been able to talk a little bit more or in more depth and detail on how that automatic or automagic um, test site development and deployment works. It's, it's really nothing fancy, but I'm really excited about it because it's worked very well for us. And it, it's really allowed us to get into some time and, and let Russ, again, the young person, be able to experience this and continue to drive that interest towards passion. Um, we've talked a number of times now. He's actually engaging in some community service this year, working on a 4-H project where he's actually going to begin teaching um, and sharing some of the skills that he's learned with others in his community for digital literacy, for computer science, and for other purposes also, which is very exciting to see. Um, and I expect Russ will be going to college at some point in his future um, to obtain a computer science degree. His interest is still in baseball. That's his big thing. And so I, I hope to see at some point him be able to take those computer science and perhaps data science skills and bring those over to the, the realm of baseball. But with that, I think that concludes my, my presentation. Um, I'm very excited to talk to anyone who has questions about working with youth and getting this, you know, this opportunity in front of them to connect. And, I, you know, I'll, I'll talk, talk if anyone has questions also about the 4-H aspect of this. Um, so 
please let me know if there are any questions. All right, opening it up. And if uh, any of the audio doesn't come through, we have a mobile mic as well. So let, let us know. Um, you mentioned that the GitLab is on the server in your basement. Yeah. Where, where is the photos all living? I don't think you mentioned that, or I missed it. I didn't. I, I should have. I, I thank you for that question. Um, the photos are actually running on a Linode server right now. Well, you know, Linode by Akamai server. Um, and I think right now I'm on a $20, $20 a month rig. Um, if I remember correctly, it might be a $10 a month rig. Um, but that's worked really well for us. I, I don't need a whole lot in terms of horsepower, right? It's a pretty minimal application. Uh, in fact, let me go ahead. Um, if you'll bear with me, I will open, um, I'll open the web app here. And so what we've done, we've, you know, added dark mode. And if you talk to Russ, he'll tell you that was terribly hard, but it actually was a whole lot of fun. And we've built it out now. So we support all sorts of different levels um, of events for folks. So if we take, for example, state events, since I talked about the state teen association convention, now here we have those individual events, right? And I can actually diet, drive into one of these and you can see immediately I'm prompted, you know, you sure you want to upload these? And I can agree. Should I disagree? Then I can go to the University of Idaho website just as a redirect. Um, but if I agree, I can get right into it and now, you know, participate in that. So this is running on a Linode server. That's a long way to say. <laughs> uh, did you have any issues with people um, uploading photos of others that did not consent? We do. And that's still a challenge that we're trying to figure out. One of the things that I'm interested in is working in some machine uh, learning systems that can be managed in a way that, you know, the data um, data is owned in some way by the individuals who, you know, permit that. There's a lot of gaps to be filled here um, because it's still an ongoing program and it's not unique to this particular application, right? That still comes up in generic 4-H projects all the time. Um, but to answer your question, that does come up. And one of the next pieces that we're looking at is basically putting the, um, the actual public photos. So if I drill in here, I can actually come over to explore this album. Now, Stack State Teen Association Convention has not happened yet this year. So when I go here, right, I basically am told, yeah, that doesn't exist. Would you like to look at the 2024 stuff? Um, but what we're considering now is the state of Idaho uses a registration system that's all online and can be tied into via an, via an API. So what we're considering is putting the photos behind a login so that at least, at the very least, we'll move them behind the login of are you a 4-H participant and enrolled in the state? Yeah, that's a great idea. I would like to take it to that next step. I think it would be really exciting to put some of those machine learning models. I, have any of you played with Image? Um, I, I guess if you haven't, I highly recommend it. It's incredible. It's probably a little bit too much for what we need in this particular application. But what I'm really excited about is the machine learning that is present in Image that, um, I mean, it's, it's facial recognition is marvelous and it's all running local on that box, which is just phenomenal. I'd like to do the same thing and be able to identify youth and parents and others who are participants in the program but don't want their photos to be a part of the collection right if i was able to provide them some means of saying teach us what you look like so we won't put you in any of the public collections that could be gathered then we could pretty pretty robustly automate a system of removing them sort of cleaning them out of any photo set whether that's facial blur right Sort of a simple technique or just simply removing those images um, we can have some pretty cool systems so i would love to explore that fortunately it's a little bit above my head but maybe i'll find a youth who has some better ideas than i do <laughs> they're a lot smarter than me that's for sure now um basically you do have logins at the level where somebody 
can log in and then upload their photos for the contest. And, and parents can upload to approve the students' participation. Yeah, it's a good question. So um, yes and yes, but also no. Um, there is a system call, we call Z Suite, which is provided by a company called Z Soft. That's our registration and enrollment system. You can upload photos there because that's where you would complete a 4-H record book for your project. Um, but that is still at this point independent from this system that we've built here. At some point, I hope to see them, you know, coalesce more, but that's down the road. So you're really, um, you're go really ahead, please. Kind of outsourcing the authentication. Thing. Correct. Right. Um, I would like to tie that in more directly, but yes, to answer your question, I am outsourcing that authentication. And I'm basing that on what the state enrollment already provides, right? Because for every 4-H participant, they have to be enrolled in the state. We have to have that information. Um, and, and part of that's legal, part of that's the bigger picture, right? 4-H has a, a group policy for insurance in the state of Idaho. Um, so, you know, as a participant, you pay in $2 uh, annually, and you're covered by the university's uh, insurance policy as, at 4-H programs, uh, which is really beneficial, right? With youth, any number of accidents can happen. So we really want to make sure that we're, we're taking care of the folks in, involved in the programs. Yeah, and my comment wasn't a criticism there. I mean, sometimes... Oh, no, no, no. Yeah. Sometimes I prefer to outsource things. If, if it will reduce my risk, I'll outsource it. <laughs> I'm there. And that's that's a big part of this, right? Um, you know, and part of this too, right? I am very hesitant to put any private or sensitive information into this system, right? I'm not really excited about introducing my own username database, right? For the fact that, you know, I'm probably not the world's greatest security, you know, manager, right? Um, and youth are involved with this too, which further opens that door, but it shouldn't mean that we can't do these things. So my aversion is to basically say, I would rather not run that database on this computer and on this Linode server, or if it's on my own personal hardware, I'd rather not run that here. If somebody else has the ability to control that and, you know, I can put that over in, in their, you know, well thought out trusting hands, that's excellent. Seems like a lot. A lot of projects will uh, right. leverage like OIDC and and one of yeah. the uh, the bigger things for authentication. I, I won't touch credit cards myself. Yeah, no, that means yeah, right. There's, there's, there's laws about that for sure. Yeah. That's uh, a great question. I'll stop sharing so I can jump back and, and uh, see everyone here. How has the engagement been with the app, and has it inspired others to try and contribute? It's been good. Um, I think we're still seeing. Um, that adults are probably very active with it. Youth are increasingly active with it. Um, in fact, we got, I think, over 75 submissions um, during the, uh, the National 4-H Conference, which was held here just a few months ago. So uh, our delegates from Idaho were really excited to start using it, and they shared all sorts of fun stuff. Adults are using it very broadly, and so we have tons of photos during the convention, which is really exciting because then we can pull those into the end of conference slideshow, which is sort of a tra tradition with a lot of these. Um, and that's always a blast. I think the youth really enjoy that. Um, to answer your question about inspiring other thoughts, we've really opened a lot of new doors there. I'm working now with, uh, let's see, Russ and one, two, three, four other young people across the state of Idaho um, to work on other applications that are also getting into this. Um, you know, some of the things that we're looking at is creating an embeddable web calendar that shows 4-H events to basically, you know, kind of broaden the, you know, the visibility of some of these things. Um, another piece that we're working on is a silly system we call Lazy Records. As I mentioned, the software we use for enrollment record books is Z Suite. So we thought it'd be kind of fun to call it Lazy Records. The idea there is, and this was inspired by Russ, actually, he, when I was mentioning to him, you know, the integration work that I was starting on Z Suite, he mentioned, you know, it would be really cool, right? I've got this, I've got this permanent animal health record that I have to keep for my goat project, 
right? I have to take all of these, you know, vaccination records and health certificates and all that stuff. And every year I create a new record book. I've got to manually copy and paste that data from last year's record book to this year's record book. Now, doesn't that sound like a problem a computer could solve? <laughs> So that's what we're doing, right? Russ is, you know, Russ kind of said, hey, this would be really cool. And I, and um, we got started on that. So we're hoping to actually roll this out or roll that out this next year um, so that youth will be able to basically take their permanent animal health records and move them over. And again, then hopefully promote that back to the, the good folks at Z Suite and say, here, you know, this is, this is a tool that our youth have built. We love it. We want to see it involved in your system. You know, how do we make that a reality? Um, you know, and I think that's one of the things that I get really excited about with some of these programs is it's an opportunity for youth to have real impact for their peers, right? They can sort of set what the next step of 4-H is uh, in their state, in their nation. I mean, that part is really inspiring and exciting for me. Um, and we get to see little bits of it here and there, which is always fun. And I think, uh, thank you so much for uh, your presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you folks for, for sitting with me. And um, it, it really is a privilege to be able to present. And again, thanks thanks to the, the Linux Fest Northwest folks for allowing me to present remotely. Um, like I mentioned, I'm in, uh, I'm in North Idaho right now, actually helping with a, a teen event. You know, I've got my 4-H shirt on. Uh, we're, we're working on getting, you know, some camp counselors trained up to get the next generation of 4-H uh, members really excited about going to STEM camp this year. So uh, after this, I'll be heading over to lunch and seeing what other shenanigans have <laughs> sort of ensued. But um, thanks again to everyone for coming and joining. Good luck. Yeah. Okay. Stop the recording here. <laughs>